present this workshop about how we carry our identities in our own bodies. And this morning started out with a bang at the Resource Center in that we were contacted by Pattinson National Center that one of our international students in the UK was attacked. He was walking with an openly gay man who was attacked and he jumped in and took the brunt of that beating. And luckily it was five young men who were attacking. That's not the lucky part. The lucky part is that the constables came right away. And so the attack was stopped and arrests were made. But, you know, what a great example of our identities, whether it's as a minority, as an ally to a minority community, we carry that in our body. And certainly it's exemplified by our students this week. And the students are okay. And the students are okay and continuing their travels. Yes, mm -hmm. important things. So um, for all of us, we have those identities, and we're happy to explore them today with Lisa Weiner who is a good friend of mine. Lisa is the former director of capacity building at the National Gay and Lesbian Task Force, and she is now out on her own with a consulting company, Intersections. Intersecciones? Yeah. Can't quite say that one. You got it. Okay. You got it. <laughs> Why would it like that? And she is just an icon in the LGBT movement and a mentor to me and someone I treasure. So I'm so happy that you get to spend part of the day with her. Welcome, Lisa. Hi, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Thanks, Thanks for being here on a Monday morning. <laughs> oh, your bodies deserve a lot of uh, a lot of uh, high fives for that. We'll have to go back later. Uh, I hope everybody's gotten coffee or tea or whatever they need to uh, to kick off the morning. Uh, today is going to be very interactive. You're going to be seeing more of each other than more of me. Um, I'm going to do a little bit of framing and a little bit of kind of uh, a little geek time with all of you. A little theory, movement theory and history and, uh, and a little bit of uh, liberation theory to kick us off. And then you're going to be spending the day having some conversations with, um, with each other about this. So I want to say a little bit about um, what we're going to do today and about where this curricula, where some of this thinking comes from. Uh, as Colette said, I was the Director of Capacity Building at the National Gay and Lesbian Task Force for five years, but I spent 20 years working across movements for social and economic justice. And so some of this thinking comes from uh, working in other movements and connecting the dots around issues, identities, and communities. And uh, I've been working with a team of about 20 people, and over the next year, many of you will be seeing these folks because they will be coming to your campus uh, to do parts of a year-long social justice training. I don't know if Milton, Colette, you want to say something about that. Uh, and then I can tell you about the curriculum and the background Yes, this is sort of a teaser. It's an introduction to what we'll be doing beginning in winter, a social justice training series, which we will give a more sexy name than that. Yes. <laughs> so if you think of something, let us know. Our name is suggested, or it gave me the link to Duke's Project Change. And I thought, that's it. We have something like that. <laughs> but um, this will be a great opportunity to not only experience some enlightenment, enlightenment as we do our own work around social justice, but also get, put some wheels on that and um, develop a plan for how we want to take that into our university community and the greater community. Mm -hmm. So that will be beginning in January. It will start out with an all-day anti-oppression training that is a serious training. Mm -hmm. And then we will have four three-hour sessions in once a month with leaders from around the world, from around the country in different movements. So mm -hmm. it'll be a great, great training. You can maybe talk about the movements that will be represented. Yeah, sure. Um, thank you for that. Uh, you know, the reason I mention it is because I don't, the one I'm gonna be presenting to you today has come from this collective of people. It is not just for me, but it is a group of one of the most multiracial, cross-movement, trans, gender-inclusive groups in the movement, thinking a new different movement thinking about um, how to connect issues, identities, and movements together. So what I like to call them is a group of kind of uh, movement architects. 
thinking about how all of these things intersect and developing trainings uh, and thinking some of what you'll see today around, around this. So you're going to be meeting these folks throughout the year. Um, this is kind of our collective offering to you, uh, and I'm looking forward to being in discussion with you about it today. On a personal note, uh, what brings me to some of this thinking, not only is my cross-movement work, but it's also what happens inside my own body. Uh, my father is a Jewish uh, Ashkenazi Jew, uh, first generation, and my mother is a Syrian, Lebanese, Muslim Arab. And so my work has been uh, a lot around issues of faith. Um, I came out as a lesbian uh, right after college, so that's what got me doing some work in the LGBT movement. But primarily my work is around the intersection of faith and racial justice. Uh, and so that's what, I, well, that's what I bring in my own body today. Uh, and I'm looking forward to hearing about all of our identities as we have those, uh, those discussions. So I want to kick off with uh, some introductions, get uh, a sense of who's in the room and what's drawing you to this conversation today, and then we're going to dive right in with a little um, with a little movement history and theory. I know that uh, not everybody in this room may identify as an organizer or as an activist. Some of you may, some of you may not. But this is also applicable to folks that do education work, that do um, work in student <laughs> services, uh, that work you know, on campuses and are just interacting with folks who are different than they are every day. Uh, I know there are therapists in the room, so it'll be interesting to hear how this framework works and connects to the work that you're doing. Uh, so why don't we start over here. Uh, will this table kick us off? I'm gonna ask you for your name, uh, what you do at Grand Valley State University, like if you work in the department or you're a student or what your major is, et cetera, and then what drew you I'm Rhonda Lovers, and I'm from Institutional Marketing at Grand Valley. Um, and we are obviously always talking about Grand Valley in different ways through advertising and promotions and things. And um, I think partly today because I always want to make sure that we're being inclusive at our own and we're in the midst of that. Great. Thank you. Uh, Judith Snow, um, I'm on the advisory board for the LGBT Research Center. I'm a psychotherapist. Founded the Association of Straight Allies, some of you know I've joined. And um, what drew me, I come to every one of these if I could. So I, when my schedule permits, I, I come. But I, I like the description of this, and so I'm always interested in everything going on here. See, I told you there were therapists in the room. Notes, I promise you by the end of the year we'll be bungee jumping. <laughs> It'll be great. It'll be great. <laughs> training for you. <laughs> Good morning, my name is Kristen Evans. I work for Housing and Residence Life. All of those of you who are familiar with campus, you know that we've been undergoing construction and there's three brand new buildings on the south end of campus. And I get the luxury and treat and challenge of overseeing those buildings as soon as they let me in without a hard hat on. Um, <laughs> so that is my position in housing. And I, I want to apologize in advance. Our graduate assistants have arrived today and they're in training, so I may be popping in and out. I, I just didn't want to miss this opportunity. I'm just always looking for 
are more tools in my toolbox um, as far as um, working with diverse populations. And so I like things like that, that are, I feel like you, you have the same general training in certain areas over and over and over again. So when you can get a niche or you can get kind of the next level, I'm always looking for those opportunities. Thank you. I'm Colette Sagan, the Assistant Director at the LGBT Resource Center. When we wrote this grant to Argus Foundation to do a social justice training, we thought, wouldn't that be great? But then when we start putting together the architecture, we were really challenged with what is going to make a difference? What is the heart of social justice training? And we came to focusing on intersections, on understanding different justice movements and the impact on each other. You may have one that you're particularly passionate about, but understanding the other ones and why their work is your work and your work is their work is very powerful. So we're excited to offer that. My name is Tim Keacock. I'm a graduate assistant in the LGBT Resource Center um, in the same program as Tim, the College Student Affairs Leadership Program. Uh, what brings me here is mostly, again, what Kim was saying, I'm very much interested in intersections. And actually, I've done some research in that and thinking about possibly pursuing a thesis in that area. Um, that being said, I also will be popping in and out a lot for training, so I do apologize for Hi everyone, my name is Carrie Christian. I am the program coordinator in the LGBT Resource Center. And um, I am drawn to this for many number of reasons, uh, mostly just because social justice is my passion. And I've really learned, um, recently I've been figuring out the difference between diversity and social justice. And the piece mm -hmm. is, the, the difference is the action in social justice. And so what are some more actions besides my 40 hour a week job that I can do um, to be committed to social justice and change for equality. Okay. Um, Joanne Wassar, I'm the Associate Director of the Women's Center. Um, looking today, what I can incorporate into my own personal development, and then in, in the programming work that we do through the Women's Center, because we do a lot around social justice. I'm Mary Morgan. I'm in from the library. Um, I'm the person for the library. Um, I'm interested in the subject. Um, I think more like milk. I want to take it to the next level rather than uh, read and understand and feel feel the passion. I need to do something about it. I'm Holly Rago. I work in the accounting office, and I'm really interested in the intersections of social it grow and try really hard to diversify um, and yes in ways um, I've been I'm on been the inclusion advocate and inclusion advocate on, on the library staff and, and so I like to take advantage of any of these kinds of uh, opportunities that come along to bolster and reinforce what we can be doing what we should be doing what we need to be doing Grand Valley, the, you know, there's, there's a place in my head where, where I, I kind of go along this, why can't we all just get along philosophy, um, and I, I realize that it takes a lot of work to, to get there. Thank you. Uh, my name is Denise Monroe-Cavura, and I'm an adjunct professor, usually in the political studies department, and I'm here because I wanted to expand my knowledge and bring it up. Okay. I'm Marlene Kowalski, Broad Director of the Women's Center. And I think that um, this work around social justice is part of, you know, a little part of my life's journey work, trying to make a difference, whether it's an educator, a citizen, a mom, a feminist. And I think for me, higher education remains an irony in that we expose inequality, we deconstruct 
a lot, and yet we have a hard time helping our students go out into the world and apply what they learn to make a difference. So I'm always um, eager to learn how to do that better. I'm Jen James, and I teach for Lib Studies and Women and Gender Studies. Um, so I'm here in part because I'm always looking for ways to move my pedagogy forward. How do I do a better job of teaching these issues in the classroom? But then also, <coughs> Uh, how do I do a better job of building my relationships with students who may or may not trust me or have a rapport with me based on the differences that they see in our, in our bodies, the experiences that they come from, whether that's you know faith or sexuality or gender, making sure that I'm better able to build those bridges for them. Hi, I'm Miriam Fisher. I'm from the Student College of Business. I'm an advisor in that department. Um, I'm here a lot because of interest. Um, I, my sociology classes were my favorite in my undergrad, and so a lot of these kind of issues build on what I learned in those courses. Um, right now, I'm pursuing a, a graduate degree in advising, and the class that I just finished Friday, we were talking specifically about um, privilege and oppression, and so that kind of tied into, uh, I saw this, it was exactly what we were just going over, so I'm you're ready to go. Here. I am ready to go. <laughs> <laughs> Quincy Williams from the School of Public Nonprofit and Health Administration. Um, the, um, I'm the director of the American Manic Nonprofit Leadership Program, and I also teach as an adjunct uh, within the department. Uh, the reason why I came is uh, recently I actually had a student who uh, was very candid and honest with me, and she came out and said she was a lesbian, and the reaction that her father gave sort of that comfort uh, of reinforcement that she she thought she would get from her father and she didn't. And so, uh, you know, trying to, how do you deal with students in that situation uh, gives me an opportunity to learn a little bit more, how to be more inclusive from that standpoint. I'm Susan Brunel from the Housing Office, and I'm attending because uh, the title was, was of interest to me, but, you know, I feel as though I'm, you never stop learning and growing. I'm Maya Kev. Um, I'm an undergraduate student. I'm getting my degree in clinical laboratory sciences. But I also work as a multicultural, or have worked as a multicultural assistant in housing. And what really drew me was that we oftentimes focus on just one subject. This is body image, this is orientation, and this is the diversity that goes in with it. And I really like to look and expand my knowledge on the intersections of those and how we can teach students that you don't necessarily have one identity and what that means in each community. I'm the Work Life Consultant in Human Resources. So I work primarily with faculty and staff, and I feel that the more that I can uh, gain knowledge and expose myself to various different um, social injustices and learning more about diversity and growing in that area, then I'm able to help faculty and staff more in that area too, because they need it as well. And um, and another reason too is I, you know, for personal growth, and I have two daughters that are very active in social activity. So they inspire me to continue and learn. When I'm Dominic Jones, I work in athletic and rec facility management. Um, so maybe kind of an odd voice. I don't see a lot of my <laughs> department over here a lot, but that's why I like to come. Um, I deal with a lot of student staffing and even the users are mostly student based, so you can imagine the amount of people that I see in the rec center who are one way or another with who they are and their bodies. Um, and on a personal note, I always need a little extra education in my little war chest because I am in a lot of environments where they're not so receptive to change and diversity and things like this. So whenever I get something to say um, to those who don't really want to listen, it always helps. Oh, I don't think 
Charlie Manomi. I currently work in the Brooks College of Interdisciplinary Studies, and I'm also entering the master's program in communications. And I think that um, expanding your knowledge of diversity issues on a continual basis is obviously going to mean a lot to interpersonal communication. And um, besides that, I also have a passion for the subject. So, great. I'm Joe Miller. Somebody needs to change that. Well, hopefully, I will be giving you some tools when we talk a little bit about a uh, little bit of the history of um, of where we are in this in this political historical moment, and then a little bit about why we start with the body. And I think maybe as a um, philosopher, you might have some. So, uh, so let's move into this. Uh, we're going to do a little bit of uh, kind of a little historical overview, and then I'm going to answer the question: Why are we starting with the body and that conversation rather than with this um, with a more theoretical conversation around the intersectionality, which is uh, certainly something that we can have too. But I want to really ground this, and I want to talk about why we're going to ground it. But first, I want to talk about some um, uh, work done by a good friend and colleague of mine. Her name is Beth Zemsky. And she is not only an, an activist, but she is uh, an, an educator. She actually founded the LGBT Center uh, in, uh, in Minneapolis at one of the state universities there. Uh, she's also a trained psychologist. And so she, she crosses a lot of movements and a lot of a lot, she's very cross-disciplinary. And she's written a piece called Building Organizations in the Movement Moment. And for any of you that want to see the piece later, I can get it to Colette and Carrie and we can get it out to all of you. But I want to do a little bit of um, her theory here. Movements move in waves. And later on the break, we'll all do, you know, we'll do the waves together. <laughs> um, but movements move in waves. They, they move in 30-year cycles. And movement historians have actually tracked the evolution of movements over time. So what Beth talks about is how do we understand where we are in any given movement moment, okay? What is the historical and political context of where we are? So what she says is social movements cluster in waves. Each wave has its own life, life cycle over 30 years, a beginning, a peak, and a trough. At the beginning of a movement wave, what happens is we're building what's called a base. We're actually building relationships 
across issues, identities, and communities that haven't actually been cross-pollinated before. Usually there's, there's all new sets of relationships. Now that doesn't mean that people don't know each other, it just means that there are strategic alliances that are happening at the beginning of that movement wave that are new to, that, to, to the movement, basically. Then the movement peaks, all right? And at its peak, that is when the largest scope and scale actions are able to take place in a movement moment, when they peak. And then they, there's a trough. When the, when the movement kind of begins to dissipate. Now, I will tell you, it doesn't mean that movements don't move continuously over a 30-year cycle, but what it means is specific movements within any given historical wave are ripples off the bigger wave. So, the, so let's take the civil rights movement, for example. That was the master kind of framing of the last wave, the last 30-year cycle. The framing was around rights, right? Individual and civil rights. That movement, rippling off that movement, was the LGBT movement, the women's movement, environmental justice, labor, etc., anti-war. It doesn't mean that the movements in, were in, hierarch in a hierarch hierarchical way civil rights was more important or, you know, et cetera. But what happens is, is that the master movement bursts all these other movements and sets the frame. So in the last 30-year cycle, the civil rights movement set the frame and the framing was around rights. And then all of the other movements picked up the framing and used it and applied it to the, to the issues facing those particular Okay, so for example, let's get back to the, the beginning peak and trough. In 1964, rights polled as the number one salient issue in the country, whether you supported the civil rights movement or not. By 1972, it polled nowhere. So the peak of the civil rights movement was from 64 to 72. Okay, does this make sense as a little kind of geek moment, historical geek moment? <laughs> I'm calling myself a geek, not all geek. <laughs> um, okay, so, so what happens as our movement cycles begins, peaks, and troughs? The right wings movement and frame also peaks, begins peaks and troughs. And what happens is, is our, as ours is on a downward slope, their master frame is on the upward slope. So think about the 90s, for those of you who were, you know, around in the 90s. <laughs> um, that, in fact, the right wing's frame around values and security, and, 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 and actually they did use you know, personal responsibility as their frame was at its peak. Our movement didn't stop, but we had a harder time winning victories, right? Because their movement was at its scope and scale. Okay? So what happens now is that their move their frame is on is in the kind of descending direction. And ours is on the upswing. But what Beth says, and, I, and when you read this article, it's really important, is that the movement moment is not a given. You have to seize it. You have to work for it. Because the rights frame is so powerful that, in fact, they can continue to win if we don't organize and take advantage of this base building moment at the beginning of the 30-year cycle. We are at the beginning. And does anybody have any sense of what you think the new frame is going to be? Any guesses about, no, it's not going to be rights, because that was the last frame. But does anybody know, have any guesses about what the new frame is going to be and what we need to be base building around right now? I do. 
guess. Yeah. Uh, something about like quality, quality of life or something, quality satisfaction. Interconnected and gets at this, right? These are the subtexts, right? Sustainability, quality of life, community building, etc. That is the emerging new frame. And what is happening in this movement moment is that all kinds of inter in things that were not seen as interdependent issues, identities, and communities, new coalitions, new relationships are being formed around issues, identities, and communities that has, have not been formed before. And in order to reach scope and scale, like at the height of the civil rights movement, we have got to not only own the frame, but we have to organize a base around it and really begin to build infrastructure to support this kind of cross-pollination. So essentially, we've got to be a lot of cross-pollinating for the next 30 years, <laughs> right? Questions about this, thoughts about this, before I get to how this relates to bodies. Any comments? Do, does this resonate? Yeah? Yes? One thing that stands out about the new emerging frame to me is the term dependence. Mm -hmm. Resources. It's about uh, long-term sustainability and investing in, in each other and, and in our movements and communities that way. So these are these are some of the key questions. Absolutely. No. saying that all of those movements and organizations and community groups that were formed around rights, which we still need across so many communities, we still need to fight for those rights. And it doesn't mean that the issues around sexism, racism, homophobia, biphobia, transphobia, classism, etc., have gone away. They haven't. So the reality is, is that what they call identity politics, which is was the kind of undergirding of the rights movements of the last wave, right? That's still critically important. We do have to organize around identity because those issues are still critically important and real. And yet, interdependence means, and the interconnected frame that we're moving into means that we're not throwing the baby out with the bathwater, we're deepening our understanding of identity so that I, I know what work I need to do around power and privilege in order to work at being an ally to somebody who, whose identity and experience is different than mine. And it's about making those connections, not throwing the baby out with the bathwater. Yes? I, I keep having this question about interdependence This movement is the one that will say whoever's on the descendants 
can join us too, that everybody can ascend yes. together in some way because we are all connected. Yes. Even those who don't agree, are, we're still interdependent and connected. Right. Yes, and this is where the body stands. So I want to move into that, but I want to make sure that there's no other question. That's a great segue to this to this conversation that we're about to have. But any questions about the movement weights? Yes. Would a couple more factors that kind of need to be considered be the impact of digital technologies and how we connect and how we communicate? Oh, yes. And another, I would think, would be that as healthcare changes and theoretically lifespans are getting a little bit longer. That's right. Doesn't that maybe alter how many movements are rising and falling juxtaposed to one another and how many Absolutely. multiple generations or cohorts and their perspectives are are feeding into any one of those. That's right. Absolutely. Does it Facebook bait. Cycles? <laughs> Facebook bait. Yeah, absolutely. And 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 the thing that I've been having some conversations about is does will will technology actually speed up or change or alter in any way how um, the third year cycle moves, not only how it moves, but um, will it move quicker because of digital technology? I think the other question is, is um, you know, it's connecting people. The way that social networking works, there's an interdependence that's happening in, in terms of communication. So it's helping some of this as well. But then the final thing that I'll say about this is that the, the baby boomer generation is living longer. And what's happening is, is that interdependent communities are starting to form around caretaking. Mm -hmm. Interdependent and intergenerational. And so, and in communities of color, that has always been true, actually. Um, but uh, because the baby boomer generation is so large, other communities are starting to experience you know, primarily white communities are starting to experience that we need this interdependent frame as well. Um, I was going to say that this conversation reminds me of the book, The World is Flat by Thomas Freeman, <laughs> yeah. and it talks about connecting on a global scale through technology. Yes. So not only do we connect, you know, locally, but we can also connect globally. That's right. That's a great point. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. My related question is when we're talking about these movements, are we referring to the United States or industrialized civilizations in general all experiencing this change to interconnectedness, or is this a U.S. phenomenon? This is actually primarily U.S.-based history. However, the, what, what I, is important about this question is that movements across the world have actually operated in a more interdependent way than we have in the United States. So we are actually behind in some ways. We, we are ahead in that there's been a lot of social movement thinking and activism in this country that is actually very powerful. There's a very powerful history. And we also have a lot to learn from other parts of the world whose movements operate in a much less siloed and interdependent way. But when you go back to identity politics, and the way that identity is formed in the U.S. context, it makes sense why our movements have been so siloed and why they have evolved the way that they have. So, um, you know, I think that, and particularly with how salient race is in this country, which is not true in other parts of the world where class and caste often trump race. So, so there's a context to why there's more interdependence and the framing is different in different contexts. Any other questions about the, the geek stuff before we get into the body history stuff, before we get into the body stuff? Was this useful to y'all mm -hmm. as a framing? Okay. So interdependence, we're moving into that moment. And why would we talk about body? Well, Interdependence means that we're going to be relying a lot on each other, which means how we um, how we interact, how we develop trust, how we share power, how we communicate, 
how we, how we share space and connect individually and collectively across our bodies, both on an individual sense, but, but in terms of organizing for social justice and building movements. It's all about the complexity of our bodies. And so we have to understand that in order to be interdependent, right? And to truly be interdependent. Not just sit next to each other, but really deeply knowing uh, each other in a collective, um, in a collective and individual sense, and, and, and really having the lens and the practice in our lives around how we share power, look at power, and deal with privilege and power within our own lives. So I like to say that um, so much of this is about Gandhian practice, which is every step in liberation must have liberation in it. Right, so every step that we take towards liberation, both within our own bodies and collectively with others, must have liberation in it. So that's what the bar is. This is the bar that we're setting in terms of how we work together and how we uh, how we think together about liberation. So why? So why why bodies? Why why do we start there rather than with the kind of textbook conversation about intersectionality? There is so much amazing academic work that has been done on intersectionality. So much. Amazing writing, amazing thinking, amazing books, scholarship. But what we have found, the group of us that have been doing this, um, is that when you start in the head with the conversation, and you don't start with the conversation about what's happening inside of our bodies, it's very easy to keep it up here. And it's very easy to not be able to hear and really do the work around what it means to be um, with folks whose bodies are different than yours. And so we wanted to start this conversation not so much in the head, but in this really grounded place of what is the work we would need to do in our own bodies and with collectively in order to make the most complex and liberating space possible. So what we say is, yes, it's a but it's not a theory because this is real lived experience, right? And the more intersectional, the more intersections that live in your body, the more it's not a theory. It's your real lived experience, right? It's about holding the real systemic conditions that prevent bodies from being complex and liberated with the hope and possibility of so you can't just say, let's create a space where liberated and complex bodies can come and everybody can be their, their full selves. The reality is this power and privilege, as we all know, we're playing out in those spaces. And the kind of intentional work that needs to be done to actually acknowledge the conditions that prevent bodies from being liberated, real conditions. And we're going to talk about those conditions a little bit in a little bit. Um, but it's a both and. We have to hold those conditions and we have to hold out the hope and possibility. And one of the things that we have, the folks that develop this curriculum and I have talked about, is there are very few spaces where there's a, there is a conversation that holds the conditions but also holds the conversation about what is possible. What could, what could liberated bodies be? be like, look like, smell like, taste like, what could that, what could that be, you know? And we often don't do that kind of dreaming because the conditions are so heavy, all right? It's about centering and challenging ableism. And we're gonna talk about not only ableism, but sovereignty. I know these are kind of maybe unexpected words in this, in this conversation. When, when we developed this, we talked about two things. Ableism really strikes at the heart of what, um, of, of this society's notion of what a normative body is. 
what is seen as normal, what is seen as healthy, what is seen as well, what is seen as a good body. There's good bodies in our society, and there are bad bodies. I don't think that. I'm just saying the dominant culture tells us what is a good body, what is a bad body, right? And ableism is one of those places where there's a real challenge around what is a normative body. And so, what, and, and, and so one of the reasons why we say that we have to challenge, we have to center ableism in this, is that it is often one of the conversations and one of the isms that never gets brought up when we're talking about bodies. And also sovereignty. Do folks know what sovereignty is? Should we have any definition of that in the room? Yes, but not quite. <laughs> yes. And the assumption of one's assumption of the right to privilege of one's own references, desires, etc., over just about anything or anybody else. Yeah. Yes. So let me just I'll provide a little bit of a bit of context and then I'm going to bring your comment into it. Is that sovereignty is the relationship, the structural power relationship between First Nations and Native American communities and the U.S. government. It is the colonial power over relationship, right? Mm -hmm. And so when we talk about sovereignty, what we're talking about is, in this U.S. context, is the U.S. government having control over the land that was First Nations land before any of us got here. So the reason we connect access and sovereignty is because what we're really talking about is a power relationship over bodies, which ableism really embodies, right? If you think about bodies and how folks who are disabled have the medical industrial complex, have society always in a power relationship over their bodies, the same is true for First Nations people have the government over their land. It's about the colonizing of bodies and land. So that's why we say that access and sovereignty are directly connected to liberation. Because on a macro level, sovereignty relates to First Nations people and access relates to folks with disabilities. But on a micro level, I'm sorry, on a, macro, on a micro level, those are the communities they relate to, but on a macro level, these are cross-cutting issues because a lot of communities face power over their bodies and power over their land. So these two communities have a lot to offer us in understanding what true liberation looks like because if you don't have control of your own body and your own land, you're not liberated. So what we have really decided is that the First Nations community and the disability community have a lot to teach us about what is a liberated body. And those are two communities in a queer context that are never brought into the con conversation at all, ever. This, this curricula and this work we've been doing for five years is the first time the queer movement, the LGBT movement, has even engaged or dialogued with these two communities. So anyway, so I wanted to kind of break that down. Before I move on to why we're, you know, how these pieces are connected and what we have, the lenses that we're looking through this complex bodies work around, do you have any covers, any questions about sovereignty and access? Did I kind of break that down in a way that was clear enough? I would just add that it's Yes. That's right. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. 
Absolutely. Absolutely. Any other very, because I know these are kind of like heavier concepts, so I want to make sure that if you have questions, you get to ask them. Yes? Um, I'm a little bit curious um, how this concept of sovereignty might fall on Latino populations of the United States. This is a cross-cutting framework. When we began having these discussions, folks in the, in the Latino Latina community, folks in African American communities, in Asian Pacific Islander communities, women, working class folks, all resonated with the conversation. Immigrants, folks who are HIV positive, so many folks resonated with this cross-cutting framework around access and sovereignty because it actually spoke to their experiences and what was going on in their bodies. So yes, and so you can actually begin to start layering in immigration, HIV status, racial justice and culture into this framework and the applicability, it's nuanced because it doesn't fit the same in every community, but it resonates and has cross-cutting implications for multiple communities, so it's an excellent point. So I want to talk a little bit about the condition, and then you all are going to spend time talking to each other. <laughs> so <clears throat> our bodies are shaped by tradition and by our reaction to trauma. Okay? Tradition meaning that we all come from ancestors whose bodies have individually and collectively paved the way before us in terms of how they built community, built family, in some cases built movement. Um, and so we're not here on our own. We are interdependent with history. And I think in some, in, and actually there's a whole body of work um, around um, racial justice for white folks about how tradition and the history of culture has been taken away from white folks in a way that has made it challenging for white folks to actually look at issues of racism because this whole piece around tradition and culture has been in many ways whitewashed and ignored in the US context, which is what gets in the way of really deep racial justice work, is this piece, right? But we all carry it, we all carry it. And trauma, violence is often a cross-cutting issue and trauma across our communities and our families, done to our communities and families and we do it to each other within our families and communities, so it comes from in and out. So we're carrying that in our bodies as one of the conditions, right? One of the conditions. And let's so let's talk a little bit, because I want to be really specific about the conditions that prevent bodies from being liberated. This is the downer part of the program. <laughs> um, but it's important because you can't talk about liberation if we're not in the hope and possibility, if we're not clear about how deep the conditions are. If, remember that both things. I was talking about earlier, that's what we're trying to hold here. So these conditions, they're born out of a history of resistance. So it's not like communities just lay down and take it, right? We There's a whole history of resistance and resiliency that comes out of the condition that I'm going to talk about. The conditions we use to nourish and those painful experiences to nourish and, and create a vision for values and practices for liberation. So
So the, the practices that we're going to be talking about today, the strategies that we're going to be talking about, come not only from our own experiences within our bodies, but they form the basis of the, the ideas and the vision that we can have for what liberation looks like. So it comes right from within our own bodies. We don't have to invent them, but our strategies can come from within, right? And we have to share them and figure out which ones apply most broadly and can be supportive to communities beyond ourselves. So these conditions, they're, we're talking about colonized bodies. We're talking about bodies that have been medicated, institutionalized in the medical industrial complex, disabled bodies, women's bodies, pathologized bodies. What is a good body? What is a sick body? What is a well body? How we frame wellness, right? Let, let's think about the media and how media portrays what is a good, well, healthy body, right? Cash economies, how bodies are traded for sale, for sex, without consent, right? Not across, across borders, right? Violence against women and transgender people and LGBT people in general. Eugenics, the exterminating of bodies, right? Think about Nazi Germany, right? Shaming and isolation of bodies, the sexualization of women of color, men of color, people of color, and the bodies of First Nations people. Trading of land and bodies. So it's not, it's about selling the land, taking the land, occupying the land and bodies, right, and selling them. So these are the real issues that are happening with people's bodies and lands. And so we get grounded in this, you know, power dynamic and the coercion around bodies and in the selling of bodies because we need to understand that there's a lot that gets in the way of liberation, but liberation, it's not that it's impossible. We just have to understand that even if our bodies aren't experiencing all of this, that there are bodies out there that are. And we have to do the work to understand if our bodies aren't experiencing this or the bodies of people in our community aren't experiencing this, we have to educate ourselves around what is going on so that we can be an ally. Right? So those are, those are the two pieces, the historical context around interdependence and then how we do this interdependent work inside our, inter, in, our individual and collective thoughts. Thoughts, questions, reactions. Yes. some of this thinking, there's been a lot of writing done around, around this. So any, any folks in the room? Yeah? I have lots of thoughts. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, I was in my undergraduate class on white privilege yep. here at Grand Valley, 2006-ish. And um, I just remember, like an epiphany moment, probably, we'll never forget it, but um, I'm like, well, trying to understand what it means, just the identity of being white, talking about growing up in Michigan, in West Michigan, what that means, and recognizing and being kind of angry with my friends who got to identify as Dutch or as Italian, or as I realized at that point my last name was lost, and that's when I started realizing what my Polish history is, and recognizing that never, ever growing up in my all-white community, in my all-white town, in my all-white life, that um, that would even matter, that that would even be a relative topic to talk about, or explore or understand better and mm -hmm. kind of coming to an acceptance to be uncomfortable with that conversation and and to know that that uncomfortableness, I mean, I don't know if it's necessarily a cost that I deserve, but the privileges of being white, you know, there has to be, you know, 
know, kind of that counter side to that coin. And so, I mean, I don't know if that's necessarily what you're looking for, but that's when you started talking about it, I just wanted to stand up in the shower because that's, I completely understand what yes. that is. So. That's right. That's right. Thank you for that point. Are there others that have want to add? about it in that this this is exactly right that that as white communities have um, immigrated to this country historically they have come with their own cultural identities and yet over time their their culture had they 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 kind of you know homogenize into this culture of whiteness and so what ends up happening is is that there's a power dynamic comes from homogenizing, right? And comes from, you know, grouping everybody as, you know, an institutional power that has come from that as well. And so as a result, often white folks are sent a message that they don't have to do the work around the culture. They don't have to understand their own specific location in whiteness and the power and the history that comes with that. Um, and so around issues of class that, that come with issues of, of white privilege and the way they present uh, and, and, and culture specifically. And so what has happened is, is that there's just this kind of monolithic white community 